Hi everyone. Evening all. It's Emily here from the Ring Barn. Uh, I've logged in five minutes early. You can just see lots of chat going on, lots of people um, saying hello. Hi Paula from Georgia in, in the USA. Hi Megan. Um, Carly, Jane. There's absolutely tons of people here. Hi everyone, notepad, pen and popcorn all at the ready. Hi Katie, Julia, hopefully you can get some signal. Hi Sam, I'm glad you're excited. I'm excited too actually. We're, I, I don't know whether you've been following us on Facebook but we've done a couple of Facebook lives. We're in a different location tonight because uh, we needed some speedy internet and uh, my internet is not reliable in the New Forest. So um, we're here at, at Helena's flat. Hi, Ruth. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. Here's Hannah. Hello, everyone. It's my partner in crime. Hi. Hannah is going to be behind the scenes for the, the webinar and she's going to be answering any questions you guys have. Um, do so, feel free in the Q&A, you'll see in your chat box that you can raise your hand to request to actually speak. Um, we've never tried this feature before, but hey, why not? So at the Q&A at the end of the webinar, click that link if uh, you would like to speak direct to uh, Emily and myself. Oh, coming on screen. Yeah. That's exciting. Um, <clears throat> so we've got a couple more minutes. We'll just wait a bit so that we give everyone the opportunity to log on before we start. Um, but if you haven't typed in already where you're um, coming from tonight, just type in where you're at so we can have a look at, I know we've got Georgia from the US, uh, Georgia in the USA. Uh, we've got Cornwall, we've got Wakefield, Gale. New um, Forest. New Forest. Ringwood, we're in Ringwood now. <laughs> Um, no, someone's from the New Forest, sorry. Oh, we've got someone joining. Oh, we've got John from Wiltshire, hi. Um, Sunny Spain. Newbury. Newbury, drove past there today. Oh, Durham, or near Durham. Durham, that's exciting. Ooh. Hello everyone, look at you. Oh, German living in Newmarket, excellent. That's exciting, lots of nice horses up there. Very nice, North Wales. Um, so guys, just before we start, we've got a couple of minutes now. I hope you've all got a cup of tea or a coffee and a notepad, a pen and um, Ooh, Lois make sure you're um, sat comfortably. It's going to be a good hour. So um, at least. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I will do my best to keep it to the hour. I have a tendency to run over slightly, but I, I will try and keep it. But I, I usually have quite a lot to say, so um, I'll, I'll see how I go. I'll, I'll try my best. Has everyone shut their door and got a nice quiet space to enjoy this webinar tonight? Or are you battling child putting down to bed <laughs> and dinner in the wife or husband? Holland. Hi, Ellen. Can everyone hear us okay? Can you just um, type in the chat box, uh, chat box, yes, if you can hear us. And is everyone part of our Facebook group? Everyone, if you are unaware, we do have a private closed Facebook group just for people who would like to be part of this equine photography world. Um, do jump onto Facebook after the webinar and make sure you are part of this group because it's full of amazing content and loads of really good questions each and every day. I think people can hear us. Yes. <laughs> Cat's been shut out of the office. They're not happy and yes, I hear you. Oh, oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> okay guys, so it's seven o'clock now. So I am going to go ahead and start because uh, like I said, um, this presentation is, um, full, full to the gunnels of actionable content and I want to get through it for you guys so that we can get as much um, fitted in as possible. Um, so welcome to the training barn. I'm Emily Hancock. Uh, 
Hannah, my partner in crime, Hannah Freeland, she's Hi. here on the sidelines. Um, and then we've also got Minty and Helena uh, behind the scenes, also helping out with the techie bits and the chats and everything. So um, <clears throat> we're going to have a one hour long training, um, the seven steps revealed to creating beautiful equine portraits. I don't know. Um, where you guys are at in your photography careers um if you just pop into the chat whether you're a beginner um sort of in the middle of your career or advanced that would be great to know um <clears throat> we are going to be uh at the end of the hour long training we are going to be talking to you about some very very special a very special event for us um we're going to be opening the doors tonight to um, our online training course, but I'm gonna leave that till the end. So we're gonna go through this um, webinar training and uh, I'm excited. Ask lots of questions. You guys can ask whatever you like. And when we get to the end, Hannah will open up the Q&A and we will spend time answering all your questions. So. Can I, can I interrupt? So normally we would say post your questions in the chat as we go through the webinar, but actually um, you guys are so brilliant in answering all the questions already that actually could you save your questions till the Q&A so that we can work through them rather than me trying to find them oh, fine. within this chat at the moment. Okay, it's because there's lots of people on, lots and lots, which is lovely. So um, you guys need to zone in shut the door, turn off your phone, grab a pen and paper, and really, really listen carefully tonight, okay? So um, whenever I've done training, photography training, um, and I've been listening to, to other photographers, I've always decided that I would try and take away five golden nuggets. And those five golden nuggets I have committed to implementing so that I actually grow and change as a photographer. So I want you guys to have that as a name in your mind that as we go through this training pick out five things that really resonate with you and write them down I want you to implement them in your business okay so <clears throat> you're in the right place if you get creatively blocked on a shoot or you feel underconfident about your final images or you don't feel properly prepared for every shoot and I know this happens to many, many photographers, it's happened to all of us. We can all struggle at times. And uh, sometimes we just don't know why we're struggling. We're, we're not sure which the, excuse me, the missing bit of the puzzle is. Um, and it never ever feels good to wing it. You, you know, sometimes you get away with it, sometimes you don't. But ultimately, if we can really prepare well, then you can start producing beautiful sets of equine images. So <clears throat> over the years, Hannah and I have both, uh, between us, worked for 20 years in the equine photography industry. And we both work to a formula. It's only over time that we realized that the way we were shooting was very formulaic. Now, that doesn't mean it's not creative, but it certainly means that we follow a specific pattern where we, um, we know when we're going into a yard what we're looking for the key points to remember um and so actually we're going to share with you tonight how we work through this formula so i'm just going to interrupt we're just going to turn your camera off just because it's being very jerky for everyone so you're just going to have to listen oh, to bye. emily <laughs> bye. okay so uh just for those guys who don't know us um <clears throat> I'll just very quickly introduce ourselves. I'm obviously Emily Hancock. I was the first female to achieve two fellowships with the British Institute of Professional Photographers. I'm very proud of that. It's um, the institute has been uh, around for nearly 120 years, so that's a that's a big old uh, thing for me as a photographer. I've created and developed a successful equine photography business. I'm a mentor and a trainer and have been for over 10 years to many, many photographers. Um, I've been creating equine art, mixed media art now, 
it starts its foundation in photography, but has become something more for the last seven years. I've got a studio in the New Forest, and I'm currently the interim CEO at the British Institute of Professional Photographers. That is a very new role um, that I've taken on recently, uh, but, but it's an exciting role, that's for sure. So then we've got Hannah Freeland, the lovely Hannah. She, um, I've been working alongside Hannah for about 10 years now. She achieved her associateship with the, the BIP in equine photography. She's created and developed a very successful equine photography business. She's been a mentor and trainer for over five years. She's commissioned worldwide. She travels the globe photographing beautiful horses, um, has a highly regarded client list. The list of famous riders goes on and on and on in Hannah's books. Um, and she's booked for months and months in advance. If, if you try and get a photo shoot with her now, you're talking eight months ahead to get a slot. So um, that's us to just very briefly, um, just so you kind of know who you're, who you're listening to. So what are we going to learn? Um, to be honest, we're going to cover a lot, a lot. Um, but first of all, we're going to look at preparation. Now, people often underestimate preparation. It's absolutely vital um, that, that you are well prepared, you have your kit well prepared. Um, you know, if, if you're not, if you're not prepared in, in every aspect that, that needs looking at, you're going to produce substandard results. Um, and your images aren't going to be the best. And therefore your sales afterwards to clients, potential clients are not going to be good either. So we start right at the start with preparation. We're going to look at lo locations. We're going to run you through our favorite location areas, um, where you'll find them on the yard and what to look for and how to make the most out of these uh, locations. And, and if I'm honest, finding amazing locations is an art in itself. And over many years, uh, both Hannah and I have perfected being able to find beautiful locations that our clients are really, uh, they, they don't often expect. So we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about styling, how to help your client get the best looks, both for you and for them, and how you can make your images stand out. And it's a really, really important step not to miss. It's often one that actually lets down uh, the final set of images. If you haven't got the styling on point, um, an image can look really beautiful, but there's something missing. And it's often the styling that um, is the, the sticky point and hasn't maybe been thought through properly. So we're going to talk about that. Direction, the confidence of a photographer shows in their best images. And I can spot, I, I look at many, many photographers' images and over time, I've been able to recognize when a photographer either has confidence when directing or doesn't have confidence. And it's absolutely vital that you understand how your client works and how they understand best. And the confidence you project really shows in, in the final images. So we're going to be talking about that. The connection, it's, again, I, I know I keep saying actually all these points are vital, but I, I'm not exaggerating. If one of these areas is not working, there'll be something missing in your final images. So again, your sales um, of your final images will skyrocket because actually, and being a horsey person myself and Hannah's horsey, we both own our own horses. If that connection is not captured, then there's something missing for that owner. So we're going to talk um, a lot about how to get capture that connection and, and see it. Um, we're going to talk about being different, you know, as a photographer, there's many, many photographers um, in the UK, across the UK, across the globe. And um, we want to stand out amongst the crowd. We want to... Oh, can no one hear me? No. <laughs> At all. Emily just texts us saying the same thing. Yeah. If anyone can hear us, can you just send us a message? But I think refresh the screen and it comes back. Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> I'll put a... Ref <laughs> 
Oh, that's annoying, guys. Sorry. Oh, yes, Rosemary can. Yes, refreshed and sound on. Refreshing work, refreshing work. Okay, we're back on. We're back. Okay, guys. Woo! Sorry about that. Technical glitch. Good old technology. <laughs> Love a bit of that. Anyway, so we're going to talk about uh, being different, standing out amongst the crowd, producing something extra special, and how you get to that point as a photographer um, so that you can stand out against the crowd and show your work off and get the best clients. And then we never want to fall at the last hurdle, and we're going to talk about presentation. Um, once you've done the actual photo shoot, that's only half the work. The presentation can make or break a, a whole set of images. Um, so for a minute, I just want you to think, what if, what if you made the change? I want you to imagine what it would be like to be the best photographer you could possibly dream of. You were producing images that are absolutely striking. And I want you to just think about how, what does that look like? What, what would it feel like? And I want you to think about committing to making that change. I feel like you guys have, have um, already come on this webinar. You're invested in making your images the best they possibly can be, okay? And so actually I want you to commit to making that change and going on this journey and learning um, and implementing everything we're talking about here today. Both Hannah and I, like I said, have been in the business for, for, for many, many years and we've a proven track record that if you follow this formula, you can really produce images that are going to uh, sell, sell to your clients and, and make you a really good living. So we are going to crack straight on and we're going to talk about preparation. Um, and I have to say there are various times in my career early on where I was underprepared for a shoot. Um, and I want to tell you my very first job that I ever got commissioned for, I was only 16 years old and I turned up and I had to photograph this party and I got there and I started photographing and 10 minutes later my batteries ran out. It was the biggest disaster ever, my first commission job and I hadn't gone along with uh, spare batteries I ended up having to borrow a guest's camera, which I mean, looking back at it now, it's laughable. But actually, the ultimate um, lesson in that was that I was underprepared. And over the course of my career, that has happened a few times, not the batteries, but something else. I've turned up to a shoot without cards. I've turned mm -hmm. up with one lens not working or, you know, and, and it goes on. So um, really being well prepared is is the first thing you need to make sure you do before you go on any shoot. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about my camera and my settings. I have always been the photographer that decided I would go one camera, one lens, and I would make minimal changes uh, to my camera settings. I never wanted to miss a moment between horse and owner. I didn't want to be uh, checking my camera and changing all the dials and and just not be, I, I really wanted to focus on the creativity of a shoe. And so quite early on in my career, I made that decision that I was going to limit myself. Um, my favorite lens is the 70 to 200. I, for many, many years, probably 10 years, I shot on aperture priority at 4.5 uh, or 5.6. My ISO, I would keep around a thousand most of the time, whether it was sunny or cloudy, just because I wanted to be safe on my shutter speed. And um, I'd have auto white balance and matrix metering. I'd always um, shoot on two cards. Uh, so most cameras now they have two card slots and I'd always have a backup. Um, of the images. So I would make sure that before you turn up to a shoot, you have got absolutely everything in your kit that you need, that you want, and that um, you want to use on the shoot. 
So then, box of tricks. This is a big one. Um, <clears throat> working with horses, and I don't know how many guys, how many of you already work with horses, have any horse knowledge, or don't. Um, maybe you might want to put that in the chat. Tell us whether you own horses, whether you just love horses, whether you've ever ridden horses, um, whether you have any knowledge of horse behavior whatsoever. Um, because if any of you don't, then this is a really, really good uh, tip. You need to make sure in order to get uh, the horse's ears forward for the, the shoot and to get their attention, um, taking uh, maybe a box of gravel, I used to take a Tupperware box of gravel, some polos in your pocket, something that um, is crackly, so like a crisp packet, um, a long whip. Uh, we've put neighing app, but with caution, because some horses, you, uh, they, they have personalities like people. So you get your highly strong horses and you get your very sleepy horses and everything in between. And um, the neighing app, could work really, really well on a sleepy pony, um, but on a sort of fierce stallion, it might just um, scare them. So you have to go with caution with those sorts of things. Um, and a bucket of nuts, as you can see Emily here in the picture, she's shaking a but bucket of nuts. And horses, most of them, 99.9% .9 of them can't resist a bucket of nuts. We've got lots and lots of people saying that they've uh, got horses, had horses, had horses for 28 years. I love Megan's suggestion. She has had horses for as long as she can remember. Baby rattles are a good one. Oh, that's a good one. That's a great one. Oh. You might see that in the next yeah. webinar we do. Yeah. Well, <laughs> on our next training course, Yeah, we'll take a couple of uh, baby rattles. That's a great one. Um, so remember to take your box of tricks. And right at the top, it's an assistant. That is um, key. Uh, I often uh, took along a work experience girl or um, you know, a friend's daughter that loved horses and uh, they would help out on the photo shoot and do all the shaking of um, polos and gravel and crisp packets and all those sorts of things. So um, if you can have an assistant, that's great. You may also ask your client whether they have someone on hand, a friend or a mum or a groom um, that might be able to also help. So the other one that's uh, probably one of our best kept secrets is a creative notebook. And we always have one of these in our back pockets. Uh, we would never go on a shoot without one. And it's used to list locations, potential locations on a shoot. So you turn up to the yard, um, you're all excited, you say hello to the owner and, and get introduced to the horses, and then you go location scouting. And this is just a 10 minute walk around the yard and surrounding areas to, f to find beautiful locations that you think you might be able to use on the shoot. Now, I might note down up to 15 separate locations um, that I would like to use. Now, I might not use all of them, but it stops me getting creative block halfway through the shoot. So if I've photographed a horse um, with their owner near a log, in the stable, under the barn, and then I think, oh, what what shall I do now? I've actually already got a list in my pocket of beautiful locations that I already spotted before I started the shoot. Again, with uh, to list your outfits and to list your poses and just ideas that you have. When you've got that 10 minutes before a shoot, you actually can think much clearer than when you're right in the middle of, of your photo shoot. Um, it also really helps to remember horses' names. Quite often when a client might have two, three, four, five, six horses, you're never going to be able to remember all their names, their ages. And that's all good detail for things like your blog or social media posting. So remember to make sure you have a, a creative notebook with you on every shoot. So um, just, just quickly on that preparation, 
you want to make sure you you know what kit you've got and be really um, considered about what you like to use and how you like to use it. Remember to take your box of tricks along so that you can get horses attention or your assistant can and also your creative notebook. Make sure you have that in your back pocket so that you can really make the best of your locations and your posing and everything like that. OK, so dream plan do first of all you have to dream it what can you achieve then you have to plan it how are you going to make it happen and now you have to do it so um i want you guys to tell me what's your one biggest goal uh, for your equine photography this year and you really always need to follow this dream plan do and if you don't follow that things often just stay as dreams and you never get to the doing bit. So it's vital you don't miss out the middle step, the planning bit. How are you going to make that happen and then go and do it? So moving on to locations, uh, never underestimate the power of a location um, that no one else has spotted. I often get clients saying, wow, I didn't realize it was going to look like that. And over the years, I've trained my eyes to see beautiful locations that most clients would never spot. They often tell me, oh, yeah, we've got a beautiful um, fountain or we've got a nice bench that you could use. And they'll give suggestions and some of them are great and some of them are not so great. But I would take them all on board and look. But if you can start to train your eyes to really see, really see uh, what's going to um, how you're going to photograph an area and what that's going to look like in your camera. And more importantly, what's it going to look like with a horse and owner um, in the frame? So natural frames, they are absolutely everywhere. When you start to look for them, you can find them. Um, you need to visualize a horse in in that area and um, you, you need to look for um, things like overhanging trees and walkways, stables and barns, any leading lines, archways, anything where you can put a horse and owner in and you get what's called a natural frame around them. So we're going to look at some images um, here of natural frames. So um, top left image, um, you can see that beautiful horse popping its head through a stable window. But what you've got there is beautiful black wood and this natural frame that goes round the horse and in the foreground, the beautiful green foliage that's just coming uh, with a bit of light, sunlight on it. And it's just, it really, although the location took effort to find, it's actually quite an effortless image because the horse is just looking out through his stable door. But the, this is one of Hannah's shots and she's been able to stand back. The chances are there's been an assistant on the left hand side shaking some nuts and the horse has just popped its head out and then she's been able to capture that perfect moment where the horse has just popped his head and you've got this beautiful natural frame. So then the next image you can see along is a beautiful walkway and all this foliage and overhanging trees and you can see it's just like they're walking into a tunnel and that's a classic um, natural frame where you know, the, the actual location is almost doing the hard work for you. And then you can see on the right hand side, uh, the lady with two horses and she's just stood on a road. But actually what we're using here is the leading lines from the trees and the overhang. And uh, again, that gives us a nice natural frame. Bottom left, you can see an archway with a door. And, and to be honest, most stable yards have an archway somewhere. Um, you know, if you're unlucky, you'll go to a yard where there's literally just plain, flat uh, fields. But most of the time, you get beautiful outbuildings and quirky, rustic barns and stables. And actually, these uh, stable yards are absolutely full of um, natural frames and you can see the middle one there with the girl hanging over the door. Again, another archway from a stable block, 
leaning leaning out the stable door is actually a real favorite of clients as well there's something that um owners just love about that being their horse's home and they're having a nice cozy moment and quite often the backgrounds go very dark in the stables and so again you just get that beautiful frame you can see top right using a tree as a um a leaning point and just a nice um edge to the the photograph there and then the bottom left you can see another walkway where the fence line and the foliage line are just the per perfect leading lines into that um mother and daughter with their three horses and the little dog you can see there so um <clears throat> excuse me props to lean on um this is another big one whenever i arrive at a yard i'm always looking for logs for gates for trees for chairs uh, mounting blocks walls sleepers anything that we can uh, put an owner on to rest and uh, so that they have something that they feel comfortable um, quite often our models are way more nervous than we are as photographers and i know that as a photographer and particularly if you're starting out in your career if it can feel really nerve-wracking turning up to do a photo shoot first of all you've got to you've got the pressure of being able to produce amazing images there's high expectation because you're the professional um and quite often we feel like shivering wrecks you know with a lack of confidence not sure what we're doing um you know don't, don't quite know where to put the horse don't know how to pose the human not sure to, about the styling don't really know what locations we can lose uh, use and it can all get a bit overwhelming but one of the things that i've always tried to um incorporate in my shoots is props and when i talk about props i'm talking about natural like logs and gates and trees and using them to relax the client so um if you have a look here fence lines are great ones to uh for owners to lean on um gates to to rest over you can see um, here on the left hand side, we've got a really beautiful dark fence with a, a, a lovely um, overhang on the tree. And the owner's just resting, relaxing on the fence. Now, it may look like she fell into that position, but that absolutely will have been posed, um, although it doesn't necessarily look like a staged pose. And same here, the middle two, images actually is our assistant Helena who is in the room here today this these were taken about 10 years ago <laughs> um, uh, so you can see she's leaning against a post and leaning over a fence people just feel more comfortable if they're not just stood there staring at you um, with nothing to lean on so um, I'd always look for for props you can see again sitting on a log sitting on a bench um, Clients quite often feel very comfortable if they're sitting down and actually hugging their horses. Um, you can see here the middle shot, you know, where the horse is. So actually, you may be able to spot in uh, this lady's left hand, she actually has a polo. So um, she's sat on the fence and then we've deliberately put a polo into her left hand and encouraged her pony to come across her lap. Um, and then she's been directed to put her right arm over the horse's neck. So um, that that's a really good example of various little different tricks that we've used. One, she's more comfortable sat down with her legs crossed. Two, we've put the polo in her left hand. The horse has come over. And three, she's been asked to um, put her right hand over the horse's neck and and therefore that is a completed beautiful image so um the big secret i didn't realize this was a big <laughs> secret until um a delegate not that long ago said to me 
I can't believe you do that, Emily. You've never told me that before. And um, I guess it's been in my head for 20 years. And I just assumed everyone looked, d did this the way I do. So um, I will look for a location. And when I arrive at a yard, I am only looking for locations that are roughly two meters by two meters inside. So if you imagine a square, and it only needs to be two meters by two meters. And what I do is look for these areas and you can see that, okay, um, here's an example. There's lots of big straw bales, but there's something about it that I'm not sure about. I, you know, I don't want the whole scene in. They've, you know, maybe got something distracting either side. And so actually all I want to do is zoom in and capture this very small area. So, Providing that there's a two meter by two meter uh, gap of something beautiful, then I can put the horse and owner in that square and photograph them. So I'm not looking for huge vistas or amazing locations that have, uh, you know, meters and meters of foliage or anything like that. I'm just looking for um, very small areas. So you can see again here, you can shoot wide if you want, uh, but if there's something distracting, you can zoom right in and you only need a very, very small area to be able to photograph something very beautiful. So when you arrive at a yard and, and you feel you're looking and you're thinking, oh my goodness, I haven't got anything I can photograph here, then use the uh, find a square rule. You just need a two meter by two meter area and then shoot in that. In fact, going back to the image of the horse coming through the um, window of the stable, if you guys actually saw what was in front uh, and to the left, to the right, you may have walked straight past that window and not looked twice at it. So that is another reason for looking for that perfect square. I mean, you can see here that <clears throat> an area again that you could shoot wide or you can come in very very close and eliminate all the background so before we carry on i just want you to type in your favorite location that is your go-to when you arrive at a photo shoot so for example <clears throat> my go-to is uh, foliage i'm always looking for beautiful foliage um hannah is always looking for textured wood that's her thing um I, yeah, I, it's it's the one thing that I, I go for. Charlotte, I can see you go for the barn. Michael, the stable, yeah, stable's a great one. Usually you can get a beautiful set of images straight away from the stable, um, a nearby field. Uh, Ruth says woodland or leafy lane. Absolutely, that's a great one. Um, Long grass, Lucy, I love the long grass, always on my list, um, on my um, uh, creative book. Robin, brickwork, um, Han, wheat field, anything overhanging from Rod, uh, Steph, foliage too, um, Andrew, barn, yes, yeah, so loads and loads of examples coming through there. And you'll find that you settle into your rhythm of locations and, and you start to find what you love and what works re really well. So we're going to move on to styling and this makes an absolutely huge difference. I remember one uh, many, many years ago, it was a when, uh, when I did weddings and I was doing a pre-wedding photo shoot and usually my clients made a lot of effort and they came all, um, you know, ready made up and hair and makeup done. And I had this set of clients who turned up and the lady, she had rushed from work and she had put her hair up in a ponytail because her hair was really greasy and she wore a baggy old T-shirt. And however beautiful full the locations were or the posing that I did with the clients the images just lacked something and that was the styling and the effort that needs to go into that area so um, we're going to talk about creating a styling guide for your clients really help them so first of all you need to decide what you like um, and, and it doesn't matter you if um, 
if you're a country girl or a country guy, for example, and you love that kind of tweed and country look, then um, tell your clients that that's what works well. And if they're into that, then that's the sort of clothes they can wear. If you want to create more grungy, funky kind of images and you like black leather jackets and Doc Martin boots or whatever it is, then you create a styling guide that reflects that style of imagery. And so um, you need to kind of outline your wishes um and make sure you deliver a really helpful comprehensive guide to all of your models before the photo shoot so you need to walk them through this process it needs to be really un easy to understand um quite often our um photographer delegates they will start by making a pinterest board and showing ideas and examples of um clothing and styling that they think looks really good in images and particularly when you add that next to a horse and then when you um, put them in a woodland location you know I always say to my clients if you wear a, a luminous pink and yellow top with bright flowers all over it if you're in a woodland with your horse and you know, I, I photograph you, the chances are your, our eyes are going to be drawn straight to your voluminous top. So maybe think about neutral tones and um, country colours or, you know, keep the pattern, patterns to a minimum. So um, you want to um, really contribute to the styling. Most clients are underconfident about what they wear and how they look. And so you want to um, offer the option to your clients that you help them go through and decide on the clothing. Quite m Most photo shoots, Hannah and I would both narrow down to about three outfits and we would match the locations to the outfit. So we might start off with jeans and a top, maybe a nice tweed jacket, um, and then you photograph in one location, maybe two locations with that, and you might add a hat, take off the jacket, maybe put a jumper on. And so you kind of adapt the outfit as you go. And then once you've done a set of locations, you might then go, OK, let's have a change of clothes completely. And then you get into a new new set of um, clothes for the next location. So it's very important that you are confident. And I think as you go through your photo shoots, you'll start to learn more and more about um, styling and what works and what doesn't. And you always, it's good to look back through your images and analyze what has worked. Uh, client choice, now this is an interesting one over the years. I've always had clients that um, their favorite outfit is not, um, <laughs> I don't know how to put this nicely, um, ideal. You know, not ideal, not ideal for, for uh, the location, not ideal for the photo, the, the final photo. Um, however, you know, at the end of the day, it is their personal style and you are there to capture them and their horse. So um, I would never discourage um, my client's ultimate uh, styling choice. Um, I, I would always take a set of images in that, but I would also help guide them um, uh, to, to wear clothing that also looks really, really beautiful and, and isn't distracting to the eye. So it's important that you let your client choose as well. Mm, direction. So direction is a really important one. Um, like I said earlier, the uh, photographers that lack confidence when directing, it is very, very apparent in their final images. So first things first, you need to um, select the location, of course. But then I would always go and physically stand where I want my client to stand. And I would show them what I want them to do. So um, I'd walk over to that area and I'd say, OK, can you put, come and stand here and then put your horse this side and then let's just see what happens. And at that point, you see, I already have given my client some good guidance on what they need to do. Now, most clients really feel quite uncomfortable. They feel nervous. They, they're not sure what to do. They're not sure where to put their body. They're not sure where to put their hands. And so you just need to remember that they're actually more nervous than you are and that you need to direct them and help them and it really will be very evident in your image 
images if you've been confident directing. So the horse, um, and this is a big one, and all you guys that are horsey out there will know that we really ultimately don't have much control over where our horses end up. So we can ask them to stand in a particular position, but actually they may move and you may try and put them back in that position and they're not playing ball at all. So I, what I tend to do is find a location, put my horse and owner in that location and then see where the horse comfortably stands still because eventually even if they are a little bit skittish they will rest in one place and then I would quickly direct my client to match a pose next to their horse. So in this example maybe the girl was looking at oh, this is one of Hannah's images but as an example, Hannah may have had something slightly different in her mind, but the horse comfortably stopped where it has here. And maybe the girl was looking straight at her and Hannah has just said, OK, just turn towards your horse, relax your hands and smile and look at your horse. And then she's captured this image. So it may not have been what she imagined initially in her mind, but she's gone with the flow. So um, speak up. When you're directing, you need to make sure that your directions are positive. And I've heard many photographers say while they're directing, <laughs> stop talking. And that's not a very positive <laughs> direction to give. Uh, a better direction to give would be keep smiling, keep smiling at your horse. Um, and, you know, if you want them to kiss them on the nose, and, and you'll work this out, but as you ask more owners to kiss their horses on the nose, um, you'll find out that quite often the kissing shot doesn't work. Um, and it's very specific. Your horse has to have its head quite high. You actually need to not really be kissing it, but only gently um, touching it on the nose. And, you know, you, the owner needs to have that head at a specific angle. But it's not until you start going through these poses and directing clients that you work this stuff out. So um, it's important to ask your client to look at the horse or look away from the horse, look at the camera, keep smiling, you know, relax your hands, stand up tall. One of the, the things you'll hear me say a lot on a photo shoot is stand up, put your shoulders back. And I'm not um, frightened or worried to tell someone that they're slouching. Many, many people slouch. It's, you know, something that just when we're busy doing horsey things, um, you can forget to be standing up nice and tall and it actually makes a really, really big difference in the final images. So when you're looking through your camera at a client and a horse, really assess and adjust what you see before you take the images. So the connection, again, I said this is a vital point of the um, whole story. You need to be able to really um, be able to capture that connection between horse and owner and um, the emotion, the closeness of the subjects together. I always, when I'm looking for this, I'm looking for a really cuddly shot. That moment, it's like a fly on the wall. You're in the stable and the horse and owner are having this beautiful, just cuddly moment um, and you're there without them knowing almost. So it would always be a nice tight shot. You eliminate distractions from the background. It's all about them. So in this sort of a shot, you wouldn't want your client looking and smiling at the camera because that takes the connection away. But if she's looking at her horse and like you can see here, she's got a very soft hand and the horse is just um, touching her hand, then it's all about that connection. <clears throat> so in this image, you can see the, the horse has actually landed where, where it's decided to stop. It's actually stopped about half a meter away from the owner. So we're not going for the cuddly shot here, but we still want that connection. And so what I've asked the owner to do, I wanted her to lean on the fence and we would see where the horse would land. Now he landed there and he was quite comfortable. He looked nice. I love his white socks. Mm. They're beautiful. Um, but in order for me to get that connection, instead of having her look at me, I asked her to look at her horse relax her hands, cross her ankles over, smile at her horse, and then his ears went forward 
Um, I think I had an assistant with with um, some nuts uh, shaking. So um, you can still create uh, the connection even if your horse is has stopped a little way away from from its owner. Um, so try not to um, worry too much about where the horse lands. You can always uh, get the connection by asking your owner then to move or to look at their horse. Um, and quite often a horse will land and it will stay still for a good five seconds at least. So in those five seconds, you need to very quickly direct your client to create the image that you've you've got in your mind. So unplanned moments, these always happen. And if you are too busy changing your settings <laughs> on your camera, you will miss them. Uh, so you've got to really be on the ball. You've got to be ready. Um, and, and as you can see, this backs up the reason for not changing settings. It quite often will happen once you've done the main set of images and you're about to put your camera down and then something cute or funny happens. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, you need to be ready for those. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry. <laughs> You'll see from this image, actually, that we were about to take the um, horse out of the stable. Um, and in fact, I've edited out very quickly his leather head collar because as she was about to lead him out, he just gave her a bit of a confirmation kiss. Uh, that everything's all right, mum, and I'm quite enjoying being the centre of attention. And luckily, I did still have my camera going, so it does um, absolutely um, promote having your settings. I love Rod's comment here is, take a sip of gin. <laughs> <laughs> Rod, that is exactly what I do. Thank you, Rod. <laughs> that, that would be wonderful right now, but I, I better stay focused. Um, OK, so being different, standing out amongst the crowd, you know, really um, producing something that's just a little bit special. You know, um, I think, like I said, there's so many photographers. Now, admittedly, there's not as many equine photographers as there is weddings or families. We're, we're a very lucky bunch of photographers because actually we really don't have much competition. We're not all fighting for the same clients much like the wedding industry is and, and I know I've been in it and you know it shows you've got five other wedding photographers out of 20 suppliers we don't have that as equine photographers but it is still essential that we um, create images that make us stand out and make us um, be noticed you need to be so good that people notice you and um, we're talking about going the extra mile here okay so on every photo shoot um i would always leave 20 minutes at the end to be really creative so i go with my formula in mind and i go through the process of photographing a client and their horse on their yard and then once i am finished doing the slightly more standard imagery that I know is gonna sell, that I know is gonna sell frames and albums and all those things, I then spend 20 minutes at the end um, being super creative and trying different things. So um, you might want to, I, I know quite often I would look at Pinterest, find some images that really um, inspired me to be creative and do something different and try something different. And I would quite often take them and show, show them to the client and say, look, I really wanted to try this out. Do you think you're up for it? And 99.9% .9 of the time they'd be like, oh my God, absolutely. I'd love to have a go. Let's try that. And this would mean that over time I built up a portfolio that really stood out against the crowd. Um, so really make sure you strive to do something to do a bit different and to produce images that have that wow factor. Now, quite often, like I said, they don't have to be, you can still capture your main set of images that are gonna sell to your client, but then over and above that, you try something new and a bit different that may or may not sell, but it doesn't matter because it's, it's creative time. So presentation, uh, you mustn't drop 
uh, you know, the ball at the last hurdle, okay? Because um, presentation is everything. You, you really must put a lot of effort into this part of the photo shoot because you've created an amazing experience for your client. You've been and taken their photos and captured their, their relationship with their horse. And then the actual presentation stage, many photographers forget that this really needs to be, um, you know, the, the kind of bells and whistles bit. You want to present these images to your clients where they're going to go, oh, my goodness, this is unbelievable. I never expected this. OK, so um, I always feel that less is more. Um, I, I would always endeavor to create a beautiful set of approximately 120 images um, because I always wanted to sell roughly half of the imagery that I'd shot. So I would be aiming to sell 60 images and that would probably consist of an album of maybe 40, 45 images and then frames, maybe multi frames. It may also include a USB of high res files. Um, but ultimately, I would be looking for a, a beautiful, consistent set um, of 120 images. And um, I would want there to be huge variety in that through locations and clothing and all those sorts of things. So um, remember that your weakest image always brings down the entire set. So um, if you look at, maybe you're not at the stage where you can consistently produce 120 images, but maybe you can produce 80 at the minute, okay? And you wanna look at that set of 80 and you wanna spot your weakest images and you wanna pull them out. And then what you'll find is your entire set gets stronger and stronger and stronger as you pull out those weak images. And that effectively is what a client is also doing in the viewing process. So you should only show your strongest images. Now, some photographers go a bit crazy on this and they go, oh, I could only produce 16 images from a whole shoot, but they're being overly critical. So as time goes by and you do um, lots of photo shoots and you start to analyze your work and you start to show your clients, you will start to um, understand what works, what doesn't, what clients love, what you love. Um, but, but it's, it's vital that you, um, pull out any open mouths, any closed eyes, any images that are out of focus. That's just not acceptable. Okay. When presenting your work, um, unless it's called art. Of course, <laughs> um, and then it's totally acceptable. No, you you know, if you're producing a set of client, uh, images for clients, they all need to be really beautiful, in focus, uh, eyes and ears looking great, and uh, owner looking great, and no funny faces or anything like that. So, um, really think about how you're going to present these images to your client. Consistency again is something that makes photographers stand out because. If a client books you for a photo shoot and they don't know what they're going to get, um, it could be one style, it could be another style, you'll actually find that getting those client bookings is going to be hard. Whereas if you have a real consistent style, then clients will come to you because they love the feel of your work, they love the way you capture emotion or whatever it may be. So I would um, encourage you to brainstorm your editing style, look through magazines, look on the internet, pull out images that inspire you and then put them all together and look at what draws them all, what make, what um, common theme runs through all those images. Is it the colors? Is it the tones? Is it, uh, you know, the bright, vibrant uh, skies that you have in there? You know, really, really look at that and see if you can pull together your own uh, editing style. Skin tones, you need to master the art of getting good skin tones because there's nothing worse than seeing uh, blue lips or, you know, orange cheeks. Um, and just find the process that works for you, okay? So delivery, how are these images being presented? Again, like I said, this is half the work. You actually 
if you're just delivering your images online as small little thumbnails, low res, they can't really see whether they look good or not. Um, they get distracted by the children running in and running out or whatever it is. Um, you need to think about how you're going to present these images. You know, are you going to uh, show them examples of, of how you print your work and what, what they look like? Are you going to go for black and white or colour or a mixture of both? You really need to consider your delivery and what your client is expecting and you need to be purposeful. So um, don't rush this decision. Really take some time to think about um, how you can present your work in its best light because ultimately you could do a really amazing job at the shoot and if you present your images in a bad way the chances are you're not going to get the sales after. So um, I want you to now <laughs> inhale confidence and exhale doubt because I know uh, this is easier said than done. And um, I want you just to take a really deep breath in and deep breath out and just feel the confidence about going out and implementing some of the things we've talked about today. So did you guys pick up five nuggets? Think five things that you can implement straight away uh, when you go on your next photo shoot, might it be the styling guide? You know, is that something you need work on? Is that something that you haven't been uh, talking about with your models or your clients? And then, um, you know, that actually you could improve in this area? Or is it your locations? Are you getting stuck on your locations? How many locations are you finding? So, um, you know, I said I usually write down 15 locations. Have you actually just been finding three? And now you think, oh, I didn't realize I could use that many locations. Um, unplanned moments, I see Michael has said, yeah. So making sure you keep the camera just at the ready and, and always when you think you've just finished, maybe something mm -hmm. happens and it's an unplanned moment that you could capture. Um, Something that's really lovely that's been coming through the chat while Emily's... I've turned Emily's chat off so she doesn't actually see your comments because it would be very distracting <laughs> while she's wondering. One of the lovely things we've been seeing is that people have been so inspired by seeing our images, they're just dying to get out there and recreate, which oh, is exactly that's really nice. the point. Really nice. And um, I see... Uh, how would you deal with weather changes on a shoot? Well, actually, uh, do you know, some of the shoots that I've had where there have been weather changes have been the best because uh, one example, and actually there are no images in this presentation of this particular shoot, but we had stormy black cloud weather and then we had bright sunshine and we had cornfields and it was just amazing, but we had to run in the barn while the storm was out. And then as soon as the sun came out, went straight back out into the cornfield, black skies behind. Uh, she was a beautiful girl in a nice little white dress and it just looked magical. But so I want you guys to really think, you know, what are those five points that you can take from what we've talked about tonight and go and implement in instantly and really think about your confidence um, and, and building that and just one step at a time. So we know what you're thinking. This all feels really overwhelming. And like I said, I just want you to take a deep breath and you're gonna take one step at a time. And remember the dream plan do. So dream about it, think about it, uh, formulate it in your head and then put a plan in place. Okay, so for my next photo shoot, I'm going to uh, focus on locations. Okay, for my next photo shoot, I'm going to think about posing. I'm going to think about styling. I'm, you know, sometimes it's a bit too much to think about everything in one go. Um, so just break it down, take one step at a time, okay? So um, we want to build your confidence 
and you need to build your style. And depending on how long you guys have been in the game and how long you've been photographing, will determine where you are in, you are at in finding your style. Okay, but I promise you, if you can shoot consistently over the course of a season, um, say this summer, you will find your style start to emerge. But you have to be really deliberate about it. You have to look back at your work and you have to analyze it. So um, what's next for you guys? Okay, um, we've, we've gone through the hours training and uh, we're going to have a Q&A session. So you guys can ask all the questions you could possibly want. And I'm here to answer them. And Hannah's going to help me with that. Um, but first of all, I just want to tell you something super exciting. Hannah and I have been working behind the scenes for months and months now. And uh, we're really proud to announce the launch of our brand new online course. OK, and the doors are going to be opening really, really soon. Um, but first, I just want to tell you about the art of equine photography. OK, it starts on the 11th of March and it is purely an online training. OK, so it is delivered um, on with online videos. It's six parts and it delves really, really deep into everything you could possibly want to know about photographing horses and how to produce the most amazing set of images and not just produce them once but produce them consistently time and time and time again for your clients we're going to talk very deeply about preparation and really understanding what your clients want and what you want and how to get the best from a shoot we're going to talk about structuring the perfect shoot and how you go through how do you organize all those locations? How do you organize um, all the outfits? And how does it all fit together so that you get a really good variety so that you're creating 120 potential um, award winning or qualification gaining or sale type images for your clients? We're going to delve into the depths of posing, how you pose owners, the different small little tweaks that you have to do for each owner and reading people's personalities and knowing whether to start with a walking shot or a sitting sh shot. And what do you do with the horse? And, you know, how do you pose the horse and how do you get the best from your horses? Locations, really delving deep into all the different locations and we're giving practical ideas and examples and, and there's lots of homework involved um, but again like I say it's all online and you can do it at your pace and when you're ready um, lighting we're going to go really deep into how the best lighting is used on an equine shoot and processing presentation and critique and this course is an all in one amazing online journey for you guys uh, to go through. Um, and we've got one more addition, an amazing support system. So um, Hannah and I are creating a private Facebook group for everyone on the course to learn and help each other. And we're going to be in there and answering your questions on a daily basis. Um, you've got access to us the whole time. Um, and we, uh, you know, are there to hold your hand and help you through every step of the way. Uh, there's a massive bonus. It's a Kickstarter session. And if you sign up before the 10th of March, we go live on the 11th with Hannah and I, and we give you an hour Kickstarter session where we're going to really delve into how you can make this the best course you can and get the most out of it and make sure that by the end of the course you are producing the results you have been dreaming about. Um, so just one extra massive bonus. Uh, to, well, there's two <laughs> coming. Um, but there's an early bird price on right now. You can save £100. You get full access to the course, the Kickstarter se session and the private 
Facebook group, plus all the extra checklists and helpful PDFs is absolutely full to bursting of information and everything you could possibly want to know about photographing horses. And it is £395 until the 1st of March, and it goes up to £495 thereafter. But one last bonus, guys, and I'm super excited about this, okay? If you guys are absolutely desperate to get your hands on this course and change the way your photography, photography career progresses, um, and you want to really kickstart your photography career or refine it or really make a huge difference in what you're doing, if you sign up in the next 48 hours, um, we are going to give an extra bonus of a one hour live session with myself and Hannah on pricing with confidence. So once you've been through this course, you're going to be, be producing amazing images. And then on top of that, we're going to teach you how to price your images so that you get great sales from your clients. Okay, so if you guys have got any questions. Have they got any questions? Uh, Shall we lots, start? <laughs> are there lots of questions. Okay, uh, but just before I move on, I wanna say that there is gonna be a link in the chat box that is gonna come up Shoot now. Up. And if you want to go ahead and purchase that course, you can do it right now. Um, it really, really will make a huge difference uh, to your photography and your career and your equine art. And it's a very, very exciting opportunity yeah. for you guys. So um, we have put together every step of what you need to do to start creating images you are proud of. Um, with this course, you'll have every tool you need to produce stunning equine portraits. And we'll be going to take you by the hand and walk you through every single step. You will begin to create powerful images that your clients will love and buy. Go ahead and sign up now to get the early bird offer and the extra bonuses. Okay, guys, Q&A time. I feel like we've got <laughs> lots of questions coming my way. I hope you guys have enjoyed it and got lots of out of it. So hit me with the questions. Okay, so I'm gonna try and go all the way back. We're gonna try and get through as many of these as possible. There are three people who want to speak and I'm kind of excited to get them on. <laughs> okay. So let's start with Jean. Jean, if you're still here, I'm going to allow you accept and then see if we can hear you, maybe not. Hang on. Jean. Oh. Can you hear us, Jean? Okay. No, I'm maybe afraid just, not. just type, I'm afraid, everyone. Yeah. That's frustrating. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let's go. Okay. Okay, question question one from Beth. Very simple, how much do we charge? Oh wow. <laughs> for a photo shoot, not for training. <laughs> oh, how much do we charge? Yeah, for an equine and human photo shoot. Oh, okay, so um, uh, Hannah is currently 695. 695 for session only, and currently my clients spend between, well, 3,000 and 20,000. Yeah. I really do have quite a, yeah, it's hard to do an average. Yes. Um, yeah. um, so then I um, now work very exclusively and I don't actually have a price guide. Um, I speak to my clients and depending on what they want, I will name them a price. Um, but it is often two and a half thousand pounds upwards. Um, now, don't get scared by those figures. No. I know lots of photographers coming to us. They're like, oh, we could never get to the, you know, dizzy heights of thousands and thousands of pounds worth of sales. But actually, there is a process to follow. And you guys all have the ability to go through that process and get big sales and charge lots of money. Um, but we're not really, it's totally worth it. And our clients believe it's worth it. And we've built brands that, that mean we can charge this amount. So please don't be scared by that. I did start out at 95 pounds. I very quickly went to 295 pounds for a session and then 495, 695, and then yeah, things changed. I so, started at 45 pounds and then went to 195 and same as Emily kept upping it. 
Okay, great, great question, Beth. Uh, Graham, he's literally put ISO 1000, question mark, question mark, question mark. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm assuming that means you're not sure uh, what ISO is or um, why I shoot. It, I would say noise. If you're shooting at a thousand, do you get noise? And it's been a question a few have asked. Oh, really? Okay, so cameras nowadays, when I was shooting back on the Nikon D2 or something, I remember the noise at ISO 800 being absolutely abysmal. Yeah. And at the time, I was photographing weddings in dark churches. And I remember looking at a photograph of a bride walking down the aisles, and she looked like she had golf balls on her face, which were the size of the pixels and the noise that it was just horrendous so i decided up to upgrade this was years ago though and already the the noise reduction um in iso settings you know you can shoot on like 6400 now and you can barely notice it um but i would say the key to not getting a lot of noise is knowing how to light your subject in the first place um I said, sorry, I'm just reading a question there. It said, what camera did I say? I used to shoot years ago on the Nikon D2, I think it was, or D3, something like that. Um, I now shoot on a Leica um, S. It's a medium format camera. It's absolutely beautiful. But the ISO, ISO on that Leica is actually quite limited. But as providing you know how to light your subjects well, you shouldn't struggle with your ISO. Nowadays, the cameras are so advanced with their ISO that oh, yeah. you, sh you should be absolutely fine to shoot on a thousand. Great question. Thank you. Um, sort of following on from that question, which is nice and handy, Samantha Kent says, what aperture do you usually find yourself at if not chasing settings too much between tighter shots and the ones getting the entire horse in. Okay, so I always stick on either 4.5 or 5.6, um, depending on whether it's a dull day or not. Um, I might go 5.6. Um, I always shoot on 200 mil. So although I might shoot on a zoom lens that goes from 70 to 200, even if I'm getting a wide shot, so the horse and the vista and everything, I would come far enough back and then zoom in to 200 mil and I would shoot the scene on 200 mil. It makes a real, real difference to the look and the feel of, of the image. And, and that's a real key point with my style mm -hmm. um, is to have that lovely blurred background and that's only ever shot on 200 mil. Okay, so a question from Paula, and I think there's a few people that have asked a very similar question, so I'm going to get Emily to do a bit of an overview as I'm reading them through. Uh, basically about editing, how much editing do we do? What do we edit in? How much processing do we do for the client to see the images for the first time? Okay, so I've got a rule, and the reason for having this rule is that I'm a busy lady, and I need to be super efficient with my time, and I want to make every shoot as um, efficient as possible, and to be actually making good money for the time I've spent. So if I have photographed for an hour, I would expect to process my images for one hour. So I may have shot 500 images on a shoot and I need to edit that down to 120 and lightly process them in order for the clients to show. And I would do that within one hour. And I would honestly limit my time to that because I know many, many people spend hours and hours after shoots processing and what happens is you get to a viewing and the client goes through the first round and they go, yes, yes, love that, love that, no, 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 yes, yes. And those three no's that the client just said, you might have spent 20 minutes processing that image and that is a complete waste of time. So um, I, do an hour shoot, hours edit. <laughs> nice. Um, and just to confirm, we do that edit in Lightroom. And if we want to remove something quickly, we would take it quickly into Photoshop. But neither Emily or I swap skies. No. We, no, we don't do things like that. If there is something that's going to be framed, that's when we would do maybe a further edit of removing and 
you know, defence that shouldn't be in the image anyway. But and again, <laughs> that would be limited to really, really um, the minimal amount of time uh, to get the job done because you don't mm. want to be spending hours and hours processing. You really need to um, set the shot up, and and this is what I'm talking about all the different elements the styling the posing the location you know if you can get all these elements working together then actually the processing time is is so minimal because actually you've got it pretty well spot on mm. straight in out of camera and tracy this sort of answers your question as well that you've said do you ever include horsey outtakes um and show that shows the horse's character i would say out of 120 images you could get away with one or two yeah. that are funny and a couple. yeah a couple at most there's quite often you know a horse yawning or showing its teeth or um shutting its eyes that sort of thing you can get away with a couple in a set um but ultimately the chance of the client actually purchasing that image in a big frame or in an album you know when they've got to pay money if they put it against a beautiful portrait that you've shot and the decision is between the two they'll go for the beautiful portrait instead of the cute funny one or whatever but you know there's no harm in adding a couple of those in mm. just for you know fun and again, I'm going to amalgamate a few questions into one here. Um, I've seen a lot of people asking about weather. Um, so do we go ahead with the photo shoot if it's bad weather? And what time of day do we uh, shoot at? OK, so usually shoots would I start photo shoots at 9.30. That's just because it suits my life and how <laughs> things roll in my family. So 9.30 till... 11 30 12 o'clock is what i would usually ask my client to allow for and if it's bad weather yeah absolutely i postpone because um ultimately if it's raining the horse is going to look like a drowned rat and so is the owner and then they're not going to purchase many images so um it to be honest most clients are happy to postpone if it's raining 100 percent um again i'm going to collect a load of questions this one is in light do we use flash? Do we shoot only natural light? What do we do? Um, so I have always shot natural light. There's been a very rare occasion where I've been asked to shoot with flash, and I have done so mainly because it was Charlotte de Jardin, who is the most <laughs> famous rider in the world, and she requested that I shoot some flash, so I did. Um, but other than that, for my normal clients, um, it is all natural light. Uh, you have to be cautious. Uh, you need to phone your insurance companies to make double sure that they ensure you to photograph horses whilst using flash, because I know some of them don't. And it's just an extra element of spookiness, scary things for a horse, um, for things to potentially go a little bit wrong. So you have to go very cautiously um, when using flash with horses. Um, sorry, Emma was just asking where to purchase the course, so I was just popping cool. in there. Cool. Looking um, forward to having you on board, Emma. Yeah. Exciting. So, um, the next one would be raw or JPEG? Uh, raw, <laughs> raw every time. Uh, you need to, as a professional, know how to shoot on raw and um, be producing your images from raw images. Uh, that they are the only way to go when you're a professional. Now, I would say that because I'm sure some event photographers might jump at me on that and say, well, we're professionals and we shoot JPEG, um, but that's because they're doing very high quantity, turnaround times are very short and uh, they're producing straight out of camera. When we're talking about portraiture and selling a frame at two, three, four, five, six hundred pounds, we want the files to be absolutely spot on. So, um, Grant, I'm glad you agree. Yes. Only shoot raw. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and Emma, I've just seen your response of it's where to purchase products, but you know, oh. <laughs> you're obviously going to want to purchase our course as well. Um, <clears throat> and in fact, Megan, great question. Uh, did you find at the start you were underpricing? I start my packages at £40 upwards, but honestly thinking about upping the price and being able to offer more in terms of presentation, packaging, without being out of pocket. This yeah. is huge, yeah. actually, Megan. So, so that really um, is a key 
uh, concept as far as if you are not charging enough, you are then not able to produce beautiful products for your clients because they're not paying enough for you to purchase the beautiful products that are on offer to photographers as trade um, people we can uh, we have access to amazing frames amazing albums and they do cost us quite a lot of money so in order for you to be able to sell those products you actually need to be charging a decent amount now why Hannah and I's uh, initial shoot fee is high uh, than say 40 pounds it's 695 pounds now that is because once you have a client that is committing to that level of um, uh, payment then the chance of them you know being able to buy a frame at 400 or 800 or 1200 pounds is far higher um, but it also sets the um, quality bar mm. so if you're um, not charging very much low low rates after the shoot the client is going to be expecting you to be selling products at those low rates and so getting out of that cycle of having clients that are only spending on average two or three or four hundred pounds you actually need to take that step um, and, and be brave and up your prices but I would say and Hannah and I talk about it a lot with our photography delegates that train with us is about getting your ducks in a row and you know there needs to be no break in the chain you need to build that trust in order to charge 695 pounds you need to get every step in line and working so that those clients trust you when they're passing over that amount of money I have to ask this question because it's wonderful from Graham Parker he starts it with I obviously am a bloke <laughs> <laughs> Hard for you to answer, but how can I style a horsey girl with a horse? Note, I am a dog photographer. That's a great question. Okay, yeah. So um, really what you need to do is, uh, what I would say first is go and look for inspiration. Look at um, images of, of clothes and girls or women wearing clothes that are beautiful and complement equine photography so you might you might look at lots of equine photography and go oh yeah i like like that tweed outfit or now what you'll find is once you've decided what you like you can present that and i mean in a pdf or over the phone or when you're at a yard and you can talk about the sort of things that work well in a photo shoot for a girl and her pony um, and, and so you come up with some guidelines. I always used to say on the cl on the phone to my clients, maybe for the out first outfit, think about have you got a nice pair of jeans with maybe a kind of going out top, but that's quite muted in tone. So maybe country colours. Uh, nothing too garish, nothing too crazy, and then maybe a nice cardigan or a jumper. You know, accessories always look nice to photograph. So hat, gloves, uh, glove, scarf, uh, jewelry, that kind of thing, and give them an idea. So, but before you can do that, you need to find out what you like. Um, so do your research, find out what you like, and then deliver that to the client and guide them to help them understand what you would want from a style, uh, a style on a shoot. Great. I've got just a couple of questions regarding the course. Um, so Marie, Mary or Marie, sorry, how long does the Art of Equine Photography course last? Um, so there are six different modules and these are all accessible to you on the 11th of March when you first, um, when it opens and you can go through these at your own pace. You can go through all of them in one day if you want to get all the knowledge. Uh, but what we do is with each module, we deliver a set of PDFs and bonuses and homework. So you might want to do the first module, go away, do the homework, practice what we've taught you, and then come back and look at module two um, and, and then do the same thing. So it could take six to eight weeks for you to complete the course, or you could do the course in one week 
and then go and do all your practicing. Mm. Now, like I said earlier, we do have the Facebook group, which is going to be a real support system for all the people on the course, and we're going to be in there. So when you're doing your homework and you go, oh, I just struggled to, you know, I, I'm looking for those barn locations and I just can't quite work out, you know, how do I get black background and do this and that? We're there to hold your hand through mm. all of that. So um, it's entirely up to you, but the course opens on the 11th with the Kickstarter starter call and we'll, we'll walk you through how to get the best from uh, the course and then you can take it at your own pace. Also, um, so anyone that signs up for the course today, you will get your login details to our new membership area. And um, this can only be accessed, the new membership area, if you can. And um, there is already some homework in there. It's oh, yeah. great news. <laughs> <laughs> There's yeah. already some downloadable tips and tricks and a checklist and a PDF that's really helpful. Um, and yeah there's already stuff in there and then um come into the facebook group as emily said week by week as you work through it and um, make sure that you ask us for feedback of your images as you start creating them because that's why emily and i are going to be in there to critique um so i've also got a, a question from rebecca is the course suitable for a beginner Absolutely, 100%. You can be a beginner or you can um, be partway through your career. Um, you, really, uh, you take the course and you can gain what you want and what you need from it at that time. So as a beginner, you're going to, you know, all the massive amount of content there might feel overwhelming but that's why we're there to kind of hold your hand and go okay just take one step at a time let's implement one thing at a time whereas if you're part way through your career and you're looking at refinement and you know how to get that bit of something extra special and you know you might not be quite um, aware of where the gaps are in your work at the minute, then we can also help with that and really take you to the next level. So it's really a course built for anyone who's keen to really push their uh, creative boundaries and, and move their photography forward. Mm. Um, Rebecca's also, say Rebecca, has asked a um, very good question. Do you need access to horses for the course duration? And may I just say, Rebecca, that I recorded um, an introduction video for you as you enter the membership area that explains this and how to um, create a network of equine uh, buddies if you don't already have them. But Yes. So uh, dur during the course, you are going to have homework that involves you photographing horses, of course, and people. And the only way to improve is for you to uh, do that. Now, it doesn't matter if it's just one horse and owner for the entire period of the um, course, because you can practice everything you're learning on those people. And that's fine. If you do already have a current network of of horsey owners and, and you've got access to lots of different then that's great but it's not essential so we're going to have to because we're coming up to running half an hour over so i'm going to try and do a few questions very quickly um emma and a few others have asked um is the course similar to the mentoring program or is it completely different and i i, I mean i'll say emily and i have never created um, such a course like this before. This is solely focused on your photography, building your talent of being able to photograph horse and owner on location at their yard, at their home, or if you want to meet them in the new forest or something. We don't um, bombard you with anything else other than perfecting your talent at being able to photograph humans and horses. So it's very focused um and keeps you it will keep you accountable as well yeah and um so so uh i think what you're talking about the mentoring is uh we we also run other courses that are fully encompassing as far as teaching you how to set up an equine photography business and the business side of things is absolutely huge um but what we find is that 
quite often people can have the business going and they really forget about the refinement of their imagery that they're producing and so we wanted to go right back mm. and delve in really really deep to these tiny little things that you know if you don't know them you don't know that you don't know them and so um we introduce you to every little tip and trick mm. you could possibly imagine to so that you guys can start producing award-winning images um and, and really get your portfolio uh, the best it can be and so that you are consistently producing 120 images that are beautiful that your clients can't resist but buy um, I feel really bad because I want to answer every single question that you guys are aren't asked and th they're so brilliant questions. So I'm just going to say um, Samantha and John have both asked about products and labs and printing and, and I, th I think we're going to have to hold it for another webinar and I, I have made sure both the girls have written down all the questions that have been not on this subject because Emily and I are always doing these webinars. We love live training. We love you know, connecting with you guys. So we'll make sure that we do cover this in the future. Um, so my last question, and it's because I've seen it about four or five times, is um, about payment. At the moment, it is a full payment for the course. There are, um, we don't offer a payment plan, but um, if there are lots and lots and lots of you that would um, need a payment plan, please e email info at trainingbarn.co.uk. Um, we'll see what we can do. Thank you so much, everyone. I can see loads of people saying thank you. Uh, Simon's got to go walk the dogs. <laughs> Happy walking. I'm, I'm so glad that you guys have all enjoyed it. Remember to join our Facebook group because we're in there all the time. There's lots of um, great content in there. And um, yeah, just thank you so much for joining us. And here, here. we uh, can't wait to see some of you guys on the course and um, keep, keep, keep out. Shooting. Yeah, keep shooting. And we'll keep you up to date with all the different webinars and whatnot. And yeah, thanks again. And we'll catch you all soon. Happy shooting. Bye, everyone. Bye.